So good morning, everyone. Uh, please take your seats. Um, delighted to see so many of you this morning. So welcome to this seventh edition of the Michael Bell Annual Lecture. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Teddy Sammy. I'm the director of the Norman Patterson School of International Affairs here at Carleton University. Uh, I'd like to begin by first acknowledging that the land on which we gather is on the traditional unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. We're delighted and privileged uh, to host Dr. Adi Imseis as our keynote speaker for this year's Michael Bell Lecture. Thank you for being here with us this morning. Uh, his talk is titled, River the Rules-Based International Legal Order on Palestine, Israel, and the Future. We're obviously having today's lecture at a very important time uh, for obvious reasons. Of a crisis between Israel and, and Palestine has become much more severe. It's an acute crisis. And I hope that today's lecture will also help us think a bit more about the long term. Um, we're obviously very concerned about what is going on. I think everybody's concerned. We see it on the news every day, and it's really, really troubling to see what's going on, uh, to say the least. So this is where we are. I I think for those of you who followed this lecture over the last few years, you know that this was always a lecture that we did in the fall of every year. And when we were planning for the lecture last fall, this is when October 7th happened. So we delayed it. And, and I think it's time for us to now talk about what is going on, but also think about the future. So I'm delighted to have someone like Dr. Imseis to do this uh, this morning. Uh, donc, uh, bonjour tout le monde. Uh, et bienvenue à cette conférence annuelle qui a été établie en l'honneur de Michael Bell, un éminent diplomate canadien et expert sur le Moyen-Orient. Michael Bell est né à Windsor, en Ontario. Il est un diplômé de l'Université de Windsor. Où il a obtenu son baccalauréat spécialisé et sa maîtrise. Michael Bell was born in, in Windsor, Ontario, and educated at the University of Windsor, where he earned an honors BA and a master's degree. He joined the Department of External Affairs in September 1967, and in a career that spanned more than three decades, Michael Bell served as ambassador to Jordan, director general for Central and Eastern Europe, ambassador to Egypt, and ambassador to Israel. Following his retirement in 2004, Michael Bell, along with Michael Molloy and John Bell, with the support of Dr. Tom Najem of the University of Windsor, established the Jerusalem All City Initiative to find a fair and sustainable plan for resolving the conflict of a Jerusalem's old city. Michael Bell also taught Middle East affairs at both the University of Windsor and at Carlton University at Nipsia. Shortly before he passed away in 2017, Michael Bell was awarded an honorary doctorate of law by his alma mater, the University of Windsor. I'd like to acknowledge the support of the Bell family, uh, represented by Michael's wife, Linda, who is in attendance this morning. It's good to see you again. Uh, today's lecture would not be possible without the generous financial support of the International Development Research Center, uh, IDRC. So my thanks to Rula El Rifai, who is from IDRC and is also a member of the organizing committee, as well as my colleague, Dr. Lamam Rad and Mike Molloy, uh, who's so sitting here. Thank you very much. Uh, you've been incredibly helpful every year in terms of uh, putting together this, this lecture. Last but certainly not least, I, I want to thank my assistant, Alison, as well as our comms coordinator, Anne Morneau, for their help in, today's, in, for their help in organizing today's lecture. So I will now yield the floor to my colleague, Professor Lama Murad, who will introduce our keynote speaker and then moderate the discussion afterwards. So thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh Higher. Okay, I'm told that I need to jet, which is not normally a problem for those of you who had classes with me. But uh, thank you so much for, for coming today and, and for joining us for the annual Michael Bell Lecture Series. Uh, as as uh, uh, my director, Teddy Sami, uh, said, my name is Lama Murad. I'm a faculty member here at NIPSIA. And I've had the immense pleasure of co-organizing this series for a couple of years now alongside uh, Dr. Sami, Rula Vifai, and, and former Ambassador His Excellency Mike Malloy. So we're really happy to have you with us today. And, and today I have a profound pleasure really to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Ardi Imseis. Uh, he's an assistant professor of law at the Faculty of Law at Queen's University, but he's also uh, uh, someone with an equally impressive, both scholarly 
uh, background and uh, a wealth of experience in UN institutions and as legal advisor in, in a number of human rights um, cases, both on Palestine as well as on other issues uh, in the international context. So I'm going to attempt very briefly to give an outline of his very, very illustrious career thus far that is really just starting up. <laughs> and I think we'll see much more of him in the years to come. So, uh, you know, most recently and most notably, uh, Dr. Nsais is the author of The United Nations and the Question of Palestine, which was just published last year with Cambridge University Press. It is the book on the UN and Palestine in English and I think really in any language. So it's, it's really wonderful to have him here to both talk more broadly about this question, but also draw on his wonderful new book. His other scholarship has appeared in a wide array of international journals, including the American Journal of International Law, the European Journal of International Law, the Harvard International Law Journal, and the Oxford Journal of Legal Studies. He's also the former editor-in-chief of the Palestine Yearbook of International Law. So when I say that he's one of the leading international legal scholars on Palestine, it's, you know, maybe an understatement. Between 2019 and 2021, he also served as a member of the UN Human Rights Council Commission of Inquiry into the Civil War in Yemen. For over a decade, he served in senior legal and policy capacities with the UN uh, Refugee uh, Relief and Work Agency for Palestine uh, Refugees in the Near East, more commonly known as UNRWA. It's a mouthful in its full title. Uh, and the UN uh, High Commissioner for Refugees as well. With, and he had duty both in, in Egypt, Lebanon, Jordan, and occupied Palestine and Syria. Most recently, he's also served as legal counsel to the state of Palestine before the International Court of Justice in the advisory opinion on the legal consequences arising from the policies and practices of Israel in the occupied Palestinian territory, including East Jerusalem. So he just came back from The Hague, I think, a few weeks ago. So hopefully he can also speak to that as well. So Professor Mseis holds a PhD uh, from Cambridge, an LLM from Columbia, an LLB from Dalhousie, and a BA from uh, the University of Toronto, you know, one of the Canadian institutions here. Uh, he was also previously a Harlan Fisk Stone Scholar and Human Rights Fellow at Columbia Law School. So, uh, you know, suffice to say, we're very, very lucky to have Dr. Mseis with us here today, and thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Mary. That's so sweet. Well, um, am I audible? Yes. That's good. Yeah, no, I will. That won't be a problem. Uh, I'd like to begin by offering my heartfelt thanks uh, to Rula Rafai, the IDRC, uh, Professor Lema Murad for that lovely introduction, which I drafted, of course. Um, Teddy, and Teddy as well for your hospitality and, and for everything that you do here. Uh, Linda, of course, uh, for your presence. And obviously, uh, I give tribute to Michael Bell, dear Ambassador Michael Bell. It is a great honor to be with you today. Where to begin? One can only wonder what Michael Baum would have made of the present moment. The empath in me hopes that it's what many of you might have also felt in recent months. An overwhelming grief, anguish, and even anger at the countless lives lost in a war all too many of us have predicted would erupt in the face of endemic impunity and festering injustice, generation after generation. Mothers, sons, fathers, daughters, whole families eliminated with the blink of an eye, not once in what would be an unspeakable calamity for most any community, most anywhere, but over and over again as the world looks on in disbelief. Since the fateful events of 7 October, during which just over 1,100 Israelis were killed, brutally so, and 250 others taken hostage by Palestinian paramilitaries from Gaza, Israel has responded with a level of violence not seen anywhere this century. Total war has de descended upon Gaza. According to the United Nations, approximately 32,000 Palestinians have been killed so far two-thirds of whom women and children, with another 73,000 injured, countless numbers among them for life. A further 1.7 million, almost 80% of the population of the Gaza Strip, have been forcibly displaced with indiscriminate bombardment, scorched earth tactics, and starvation as a tool of war deployed against them. 
Humanitarian aid is in frighteningly short supply as objects indispensable for the survival of the civilian population continue to be arbitrarily withheld by the occupying power. Life-saving medicines, anesthetics, food, fuel, water, electricity. According to the Integrated Food Security Phase Classification, just days ago they issued a report, quote, famine is in imminent in the northern governorates of Gaza and projected to occur any time between mid-month March this month and May 2024. Gaza, a place I once called home. <clears throat> when I served there with UNRWA, is being ground to dust. No place is safe, no home, no hovel, no refugee camp, no hospital, no school, no UN shelter, not in the north, not in the middle, not in the south, nowhere. What of law in all of this? For international lawyers and policymakers, the issue of how to get this to stop and how to address accountability and reparations from the Commission or for the Commission of Internationally Wrongful Acts, including international crimes, is perhaps the most important aspect of what we do. This is because we still live in a world where skeptics argue, as the dear John Bolton once did, that, quote, international law is not law, he said. It is merely, quote, a series of political and moral arrangements that stand or fall on their own merits, and anything else is simply theology and superstition masquerading as law, end quote. In her oral submission before the International Court of Justice on behalf of South Africa in its case against Israel under the Genocide Convention, Irish barrister Blinne Nirale offered something of a response to this skeptical view, albeit with a sober warning. In urging the court to indicate provisional measures owing to the, quote, imminent risk of death, harm, and destruction that Palestinians in Gaza face today, she point and poignantly added, quote, the very reputation of international law, its ability and willingness to bind and to protect all peoples equally, hangs in the balance, end quote. As many of you kn will know, by order dated 26 January 2024, the court did find it plausible that Israel is violating the Genocide Convention in the Gaza Strip, a massive event in legal, political, and historical terms, given the history we're all familiar with, of, co of course. But it will be some time before the court deals with the merits phase of the case, which can take many years. And so, in this interim period, while the people of the region continue to suffer untold violations of their rights, Bolton's dismissal of international law remains prescient. Is international law actually universal? Is it really law? Or do we live in a world where international law exists for thee, but not for me? In a hearing before the House of Commons Standing Committee on Foreign Affairs and International Development in December last year, I made three key points that animate the essential message I wish to invite you to consider today. And because we're here at the Norman Patterson School in Ottawa, I focus on Canada's foreign policy and international law. First, Canada's declared commitment to the rules-based international legal order is crucial to maintaining its moral standing in the world, I told the committee. Second, for Canada's declared commitment to international law to result in concrete diplomatic and reputational gains on the international plane, it must both be and be seen to be credible by others. Third, by all objective accounts, Canada has failed to maintain its credibility when it comes to upholding international law in practice. And this is evidenced by very clear double standards applied by Canada which derive from an apparent prioritization of political preference and alliance over universal application of norms and the rule of law. To illustrate this, I should like to spend the rest of my talk today briefly examining Canada's position on the situation in occupied Ukraine with that in occupied Palestine. I may very well touch on Myanmar and Gambia, which I added just this morning as well. 
Like you, I was raised on the principle that the rules-based international legal order that Canada helped forge in the immediate aftermath of World War II was something of a paradigm shift, that there was a rule of the jungle before 1945 and a rule of law thereafter. This view appears to have held in Ottawa, at least when it comes to Ukraine. In the month before Russia invaded Ukraine, again, I should say, in February 2022, Global Affairs Canada issued a press release that affirmed, and I quote, throughout its history, Canada has played a significant role in the creation and upholding of the rules-based international order, which is instrumental to the preservation of global peace and security. When these rules are challenged, Canada must stand up and work with its allies to prevent their deterioration, end quote. In the same press release, Canada affirmed, quote, its steadfast support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity, and its opposition to, quote, Russia's aggression and ongoing destabilizing activities in and around Ukraine. Now, this support for Ukraine was not new at that time to mark what Ukraine calls its national, quote, day of resistance, to the occupation of the Autonomous Republic of Crimea and the city of Sevastopol, on 26 February 2021, Foreign Minister Jolie's predecessor, Mr. Garneau, then reiterated Canada's, quote, unequivocal condemnation of Russia's illegal invasion and annexation of Crimea, and affirmed Canada's, quote, stand with the people of Ukraine who continue to fight tirelessly for their fundamental rights and freedoms, end quote. To underscore the point, Garneau stated that for seven consecutive years, Russia has repeatedly ignored calls from the international community to reverse its decision to illegally annex and occupy Crimea, which grossly violated Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. Russia must comply with its international obligations and cease its illegal occupation of Crimea. To that end, Canada has joined a number of countries to impose sanctions on Russia, to hold it accountable for its actions, a position it rightly, in my view, if doggedly maintains to this day. Because Canada has invoked its fidelity to the rules-based international order and justification of its resolve to apply sanctions on Russia, the best place to begin is with reference to the two core principles of international law that underpin Ottawa's position on Russia's occupation of Crimea. First, is the principle prohibiting the acquisition of territory through the threat or use of force. Second, is the right of peoples to self-determination and the obligation to respect that right. The normative force of these two core principles is expressed in the general rule that governs the law of belligerent occupation. That occupation of enemy territory is meant to be a temporary condition and that the occupying power may not, by virtue of its occupation, rightfully claim sovereignty over any such territory. The international lawyers among you will recognize these two principles as what we call use Kogan's norms or peremptory norms, derogation from which is not permitted under international law. They apply at all times. The reason for the absolute character of these principles is self-evident. Any other approach would propel us back to the 19th century and beyond, a time when, to quote von Clausewitz, war was a continuation of policy by other means and territorial conquest perfectly legal. You might ask, therefore, why would any of this matter for Canada in the Middle East? Of course, I'm telegraphing it for you, aren't I? The short answer is that by all objective accounts, Ottawa is playing fast and loose with its purported commitment to these bedrock principles of international law. Nowhere, nowhere rather, is this made more apparent than when we juxtapose its sound position on Russia's illegal occupation of Ukraine with its severely duplicitous one on Israel's illegal occupation of Palestine, which is of course the context from which 7 October, and the current situation in Gaza has emerged. And in this regard, I rely on the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who said that October the 7th did not happen in a vacuum. You'll recall when he said that. 
Since 1967, Israel has been in belligerent occupation of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, otherwise known in UN parlance as the Occupied Palestinian Territory, or since 29 November 2012, the State of Palestine. And during this unusually prolonged 57-year occupation, Israel has pursued a policy of systematically and forcibly altering the status of occupied Palestine with the open aim of annexing de jure or de facto most or all of it. This has been done in violation of the very same bedrock principles purportedly underpinning Canada's position on occupied Ukraine, namely the inadmissibility of territorial conquest and the right of peoples to self-determination. At the heart of Israel's violations of these principles is its policy of transferring its own civilian population into the OPT in violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention, the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, and customary international law. According to a 2013 UN fact-finding mission, so 11 years ago, each Israeli government since 1967 has, quote, openly led and directly participated in the planning, construction, development, consolidation, and or encouragement of settlements, end quote, in the occupied Palestinian territory through various political, military, and economic means. And today, according to the UN Secretary General, between 19 and 23 percent of the population of the West Bank, including East Jerusalem, some estimated 700,000 persons, are Israeli settlers, and their numbers continue to grow. The illegality of the settlements has been affirmed by each of the relevant principal organs of the United Nations countless times over the years, including the Security Council, the General Assembly, ECOSOC, the Secretariat, and of course the ICJ. And in this regard, most relevant for assessing Canada's position in security count is can Security Council Resolution 2334 of 2016, which affirms that the settlements have, quote, no legal validity and constitute, quote, a flagrant illegality, rather, forgive me, a flagrant violation under international law. It further calls upon all states, bearing in mind the illegality of the settlements, to, quote, distinguish in their relevant dealings between the territory of the State of Israel and the territories occupied since 1967, end quote. The duty to distinguish between these territories in their relevant dealings. In view of Canada's purported commitment to the rules-based international legal order, one would expect Ottawa to scrupulously follow the terms of Council Resolution 2334. Unfortunately, this has not been the case while Global Affairs Canada indicates that Canada's official position remains that Israel is an occupying power in the occupied Palestinian territory, and that Israeli settlements are, quote, a violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention, end quote, the government has pursued a policy that by all accounts aids and assists in the maintenance of this violation. Canada's culpability rests in its policy of allowing for the duty-free import of Israeli settlement products under the terms of a bilateral treaty known as the Canada-Israel Free Trade Agreement. Under SIFTA, quote, Israel territory is defined not by its national borders, as Canada is, as Canada's borders are defined under the treaty, but rather, quote, as the territory where Israel's customs laws are applied, end quote. Citing the 1995 Paris Protocol, a temporary agreement between Israel and the Palestine Liberation Organization, which purported to create a single customs union between areas of the occupied Palestinian territory under Palestinian self-governing control and Israel, the Attorney General of Canada now takes the position that it is, quote, reasonable to label Israeli settlement products as, quote, products of Israel, end quote when they are in fact imported, when they are imported into Canada, and when they are in fact produced in occupied Palestine. For its part, the state of Palestine has made it clear that, quote, at no point has it acquiesced in the view that any portion of the occupied Palestinian territory forms part of the state of Israel for any purpose, including matters of customs and trade, end quote. At any rate, under Articles 7, 8, and 47 of the Fourth Geneva Convention, no special agreement between an occupying power and an occupied population, such as the Paris Protocol, 
can be allowed to derogate from the rights of the con that the convention confers on the latter, on the protected population. As some of you may know, a challenge to this labeling issue has been brought by one concerned Canadian, David Kattenberg is his name, and the matter is working its way through the legal system. For Canada, however, the most important points are this. First, on its face, the terms of this Canada-Israel free trade agreement are illegal under international law for being in violation of the two peremptory norms earlier noted, namely the prohibition on territorial conquest and the obligation to respect the right of peoples to self-determination. For the authority for that, just see Article 53 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Any treaty in violation of a peremptory norm is void ab initio from the beginning as a matter of international law. Two, or rather second, the terms of SIFTA do not comport with Canada's obligations under Security Council Resolution 2334 to, quote, distinguish in its relevant dealings between the territory of the State of Israel and the territories occupied since 1967. I should add, in parentheses, that the labeling of settlement products is not really the issue, but rather the wholesale banning of such products to the Canadian markets. Third, Canada is also clearly in breach of its obligation to respect and ensure respect for the Fourth Geneva Convention. See Common Article 1 of the Geneva Conventions of 1949 for that. Fourth, the same is arguably true of its obligations under the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, which make clear that settlements are war crimes. And finally, under the law of state responsibility, instead of aiding and assisting Israel in its violations of international law, Canada is obligated to cease this conduct forthwith and unconditionally. Another aspect of Canada's policy on Israel-Palestine that runs counter to its ostensible commitment to the rules-based international legal order is its position on Palestine's reliance on international judicial mechanism as a means of pacifically seeking justice. The relevant issues concern Palestine's accession to the Rome Statute of the International Criminal Court, as well as its reliance on the ICJ. I shall briefly address each of these in turn. As is well known, Gaza often, rather forgive me, Canada often boasts of the pivotal role it played in the creation of the ICC. It was the first state party to domesticate the Rome Statute, and it has, continu it has continued to support the court in its operations and to encourage universal ratification of its statute. At a meeting of the Assembly of States Parties in 2015, Canada affirmed, quote, that the ICC is an independent judicial body and as such must be free from political interference, end quote. It further committed to, quote, work together in a spirit of cooperation in pursuit of our common goal of ending impunity and delivering justice for the victims of the most serious crimes of concern to the international community as a whole, end quote. On 20 December 2019, the Office of the Prosecutor of the ICC concluded a four-year preliminary examination into the situation in Palestine. The prosecutor determined that, quote, there is a reasonable basis to initiate an investigation into the situation in Palestine, and that she was satisfied that, quote, war crimes have been or are being committed in the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip, including in the form, of course, of Israeli settlements, that, quote, potential cases arising from the situation would be admissible and that, quote, there are no substantial reasons to believe that an investigation would not serve the interests of justice. Of course, this was all predating the events in Gaza, which have unfolded over the past five months. Instead of initiating an investigation as she was entitled to do, the prosecutor decided to seek a ruling of the pretrial chamber on the, quote, scope of the court's territorial jurisdiction and the situation in Palestine. Specifically, she shot, sought confirmation that the territory over which the court may exercise its jurisdiction under the Rome Statute comprises the occupied Palestinian territory, that is, the West Bank, including East Jerusalem and the Gaza Strip. And to assist this task, the pretrial chamber invited states to submit observations on the question before the court, the question of territorial scope of the application of the Rome Statute. Of the 123 states' parties to the Rome Statute that could have made submissions, only seven did so, and while Canada did not join them, it nevertheless submitted a bilateral communication directly to the court. And based on the public record, it is apparent 
that the intervention of the seven intervener states plus Canada was the result of political lobbying on the part of Israel, the occupying power, who is not party to the Rome Statute. A critical examination of these observations reveals that they shared a common denominator of sorts, namely that none of them attempted to answer the question posed before the, before the office, or rather posed by the office of the prosecutor, on the scope of the court's territorial jurisdiction. But instead, they advanced a number of arguments aimed at impugning the very notion that the court had any jurisdiction at all on the basis that Palestine is not a state and therefore does not have the capacity to accede to the Rome Statute. Thus, Canada's communication to the court purportedly affirmed that, quote, it does not recognize a Palestinian state and therefore does not recognize the accession of such a state to international treaties, including the Rome Statute. Notwithstanding these attempts to derail the, court of, the course of justice, the pretrial chamber, as was predicted, of course, by anyone who's a sentient being and working in international law in the world at the time, eventually ruled that it does not indeed, that rather it does indeed have jurisdiction over the situation in Palestine and that the scope territorially of the court's jurisdiction is the territory of the state of Palestine being the occupied Palestinian territory. On 3 March 2021, the Office of the Prosecutor officially launched its investigation into the situation in Palestine, which of course is ongoing given the present situation in Gaza, made much, much more important now than ever before. Now, none of this is to say that Canada is bound as a matter of international law to recognize Palestine as a state. I underscore the words bound, too. And while I happen to hold the view, and this might come up in Q&A if you like, that Palestine is a state under international law, and that recognition by Ottawa would be the right political thing to do, especially at this time, I well appreciate that policymakers in Ottawa still have questions about that. But nevertheless, when it comes to the fight against impunity for perpetrators of the most serious crimes of concern to the international community, the very object and purpose of the Rome Statute that Canada so readily claims to have proudly supported over the years, one is left wondering why, when Palestine has attempted to legitimately avail itself of this nonviolent legal means of redress Canada could not have simply abided by that age-old maxim of doing no harm by joining the majority of states' parties and simply remaining silent on the matter of Palestine's accession. The result has been for Canada to now find itself in the absurd position of calling for accountability for those who committed atrocities in Israel-Palestine, both on the Hamas side and on the Israeli side, since October the 7th, while depriving the parties of any real recourse to international justice. It's absurd. As for Canada's response to Palestine's reliance on the International Court of Justice, a different court that deals with state responsibility, not individual criminal responsibility, yeah, things don't look much better. On the 30th of December, 2022, the General Assembly of the United Nations passed Resolution 77-247 by which it requested an advisory opinion from the court on a series of questions, the nub of which has been to ask whether Israel's 57-year occupation of the occupied Palestinian territory is itself unlawful. Canada, of course, voted against the resolution. But based on the UN record, if Israel's occupation was not illegal from its start, and there's a strong case for that, it has become illegal, in my respectful view, over time for its violation of a number of Yus Kogan's norms, derogation from which is not permitted under international law. We've spoken about a few of those. The first two are the prohibition on territorial conquest and the obligation to respect the people's right to self-determination. But there's a third, the prohibition against regimes of alien subjugation, domination, and exploitation, including racial discrimination and apartheid. And again, I'm working on the case for Palestine. So I'm well familiar with it. If the court finds the occupation to be illegal, one of the principal consequences of this will be that it must come to a complete, unconditional, and total end. That is to say, the end of the occupation may not be made subject to negotiation. In the matter on Chagos before the same court in 2019, when the court ruled that the United Kingdom's continued presence 
in the Chagos Islands, which belonged to Mauritius and which were not properly decolonized in 1965, the court said that the United Kingdom had a duty to remove itself or withdraw from the Chagos Islands, quote, as rapidly as possible. And the General Assembly thereafter indicated that that meant within six months' time. Another consequence of a ruling that Israel's occupation of the OPT would be unlawful is that no third state, including Canada, may recognize the occupation as legal, nor aid or assist in its maintenance. Palestine has been joined in arguing that the occupation is illegal by almost 50 other states from all regions on the planet. Indeed, I take great pride in saying that this case has attracted more participants and by a mile, by over double, than any other case in the history of the International Court of Justice and its predecessor, the Permanent International Court of Justice. That's 100 years of international jurisprudence. For its part, Canada has argued that although it concedes in, in a six-page memo, by contrast, Pal Palestine's memo was about 400 pages, Qatar 500, South Africa and Namibia in the 50s to 100, Canada submitted a five or six-page brief. They argue that it can, they concede that the General Assembly has the competence to seek an advisory opinion on the questions put before the court. And they also concede that the court has jurisdiction to entertain the matter. But Canada argues that the court should nevertheless exceptionally exercise its discretion not to hear the matter for two reasons. First, that Israel has not consented to have the matter adjudicated by the court. And you know international law operates by state consent, right? And second, the Security Council has established a framework to resolve the Israel-Palestine conflict, after all, through the bilateral negotiations of the land for peace formula, some 30 or 40 years on. That's the Canadian position, as well as the UK position and the US position, and so on. Based on the jurisprudence of the court, which Canada well knows and understands, and that's the point. To call these arguments flimsy would be putting it kindly. State consent only arises in contentious disputes before the court, not in advisory opinions. And in an advisory opinion case, there is no dispute as such. The General Assembly, not any single state, including Palestine, has asked a series of legal questions of the International Court of Justice to assist it in discharging its permanent responsibility for the question of Palestine in accordance with international law. These same objections were raised by the United Kingdom in the Chagos matter, and they failed. And indeed, they have failed. Each and every time these objections have been put before the International Court of Justice on any advisory opinion case, they've never won in the history of the ICJ on these arguments. And of course, the General Assembly's permanent responsibility for the question of Palestine is of concern to the international community as a whole, not merely the parties to the conflict allegedly engaged in a dispute. Likewise, the prospect of a negotiated resolution of the Israel-Palestine conflict, if one ever comes about after all these years, is not incompatible with the requirement that the resolution of that problem be consistent with international law. And as the principal judicial organ of the UN, it is the court's role to clarify legal rights and obligations of all states and the United Nations in the Israel-Palestine conflict. So even if negotiations are, are around, those negotiations must be consistent with international law. And so there is a role for the court to play, and that is consistent with its jurisprudence. And I, I never offer a guarantee on any legal case. I offer you a guarantee on this argument. The Canadians will not win. There is jurisdiction, and the court will not exercise discretion not to seize itself of the matter. But what points up the double standard in Canada's position is that on the one hand, it recognizes that the Palestinian people have a right to self-determination and that their self-determination unit is indeed the occupied Palestinian territory within which Israel can never be sovereign by law. On the other hand, Canada argues that the only way for the Palestinian people to end the occupation and exercise their right to self-determination is through negotiation with the occupying power. But Canada surely knows that as a peremptory norm of ergo omnes character that is opposable against all, all states are required to respect and do nothing to impede the Palestinian people's right to self-determination. By making the end of occupation 
and realization of Palestinian self-determination, contingent on negotiation between an occupying power that the UN record, decades worth of it, itself demonstrates has been manifestly acting in bad faith for 57 years, and an occupied population held captive by it, Canada's position just doesn't hold up under prevailing international law. Another more recent example of Canada's anomalous position regarding Palestine at the ICJ concerns the South Africa matter against Israel under the Genocide Convention. Some of you may recall that shortly after that case was filed by the South Africans, the Prime Minister issued a curious public statement indicating that Canada does not, quote, support the premise, end quote, of the South Africa case. This gave rise to a number of questions. Whatever did he mean by premise? Was there a lack of evidence in support of the South African claim? Did Ottawa reject outright the, even the possibility that the claim had any merit? After a little digging into the record, things became clearer for me. And it has to do with Canada's position in another case currently under the Genocide Convention, rather, in another case under the Genocide Convention, currently before the court. That of Gambia and Myanmar, dealing with the Rohingya matter where Gambia alleges that Myanmar is engaged in genocide against the Rohingya. In a joint declaration of intervention filed by Canada, Denmark, France, Germany, the Netherlands, and the UK, shortly before South Africa's case was filed against Israel, and which they filed in the Gambia matter, the Canadians and their Western allies took a very liberal and permissive approach to the interpretation of the Genocide Convention. Among other things, they asserted that, quote, a proper construction of the convention um, requires that we appreciate that forced displacement may lead to genocide. Clearly, in the face of this public position, and given the facts as found so far by the court as they pertain to Gaza, where 1.1 million Palestinians were forcibly transferred early on in the war from Gaza City, ordered to go south by the IDF, ostensibly for their safety and in safe zones, only to be bombed on their way to the so-called safe zones, or when they got to the south safe zones, south of Wadi Gaza, to be bombarded indiscriminately there, to be starved as a tool of war, and so on. In view of those facts, were Canada to even suggest the plausibility that genocide was happening in Gaza, it would find itself in a very difficult position, having to explain away its position in the Myanmar case. This may be why Canada has yet to publicly call for Israel to abide by its binding obligations under the Provisional Measures Order of 26 January 2024, something that they did do with respect to other provisional measures, certainly as were issued in the Gambia matter and so on. In conclusion, it should be self-evident that international law is only as strong as the willingness of states to ensure its universal application. The horrific situation in Gaza is proof positive of this. As people long kept bereft of the benefits of international justice clamor just to stay alive. Unfortunately, when one scratches away at the surface of Canada's high sounding postulations of principle, one is hard pressed to take seriously its purported fidelity to the rules-based international legal order. The very same principles it purports to be driving its progressive foreign policy agenda in places like occupied Ukraine and Myanmar, etc., are being blatantly violated by it when it comes to Israel-Palestine. And the result is to cast a long shadow of hypocrisy on Ottawa's image in the world, a shadow which by all accounts has and will continue to have results, negative results, for Canada on the international stage. With that, I'll conclude. And in the Q&A, happy to discuss more broadly Israel-Palestine and the future, as this title, which I suggested some weeks ago, uh, suggests we will do. Thank you.